one of the organizational updates is that this year we get to fill out the full 990 form and our fiscal year end ended on uh, December 31st. We have until mid-May to complete the 990. The good news is that uh, we have several people that have some experience in filling out this form um, and we should be able to do it well before May uh, 2021. We have some, some um, guidance and some information from Foundation Group uh, they're offering to, to help uh, and the Cal nonprofits uh, 501c3 that helps 501c3s in California also has some helpful checklists so we should be able to do this without too much trouble. And that's that for, for taxes. There's a few other forms that are biannual that we filled out last year. And I'm just going to go through the entire checklist to make sure that nothing got missed or, or that uh, we don't have any annual things that need to be done. We're not expecting to have to, have to pay any taxes, right? Just file. Yeah, we have to file. And the, the 990 that we've filed so far has been the postcard, which is honestly a postcard. And it's it's very very brief. So if your if your assets are less than uh, I believe it's fifty thousand, then you're you file the postcard, and it it could not be any easier. And the nine ninety is a little more extensive. So there's a, a different categories and and tracking and additional paperwork that needs to be done. So we will get to do that this year. All right. So um, we have the idea in our architecture paper about a default digital downlink. This um, is something that happens that is transmitted on the downlink when no user communications are taking place. And this is for several reasons. The first and most important is that it provides a constant signal and content for people to test their receivers. The idea is to cycle through a variety of combinations of modulation and coding, uh, all of the ones that we are capable of. And this sort of uh, default digital downlink is uh, something that can be extended to a, a beacon. So not just for the space transponder in order to test the, the channel to test people's receivers on the ground, but also can be deployed as a terrestrial beacon in, uh, in any number of microwave bands. So when we started talking about beacons, there were some questions. So um, Douglas Quagliana asked about beacons, and he, he says his suggestions are uh, a simple beacon, uh, the simplest possible be included. So not just the mod CODs for DBBS2 and S2X, but something like uh, the IARU beacon style. And he says, getting beyond this very basic, is this thing actually on, uh, like a constant carrier or constant carrier with stepped attenuation? He says, you should also include um, a traditional beacon that says something like, like, hi, this is the beacon on, you know, this transponder. Uh, and and so it'll, he says, the power of this is to allow you to try an A versus B comparison at your ground station, just so that you can tell, well, does this change make the signal I'm hearing better or worse? Um, so I thought that was good, and I'm not familiar with these things uh, in detail. So I asked about, uh, well, what is this style of beacon? The IARU approach is a transmission that consists of the call sign of the beacon, and it's sent at 22 words per minute. It's followed by four one-second dashes. The call sign and the first dash are sent at 100 watts. The remaining dashes are sent at 10, one, 10 watts, 1 watt, and 100 milliwatts. And his opinion is that the one second dashes are too short. It prefer them to be five or 10 second dashes. But if you wanna go around the list of stations and the band pretty quickly, then you know that's the, the original reason for them being, being so short, but we wouldn't be in such a rush. For Oscar style traditional beacons, it's any modulation that's already being used. It just has to start with uh, hi or hello. And in his recollection, the, uh, on AO21, the AX.25 packet downlink had one AX25 frame that says, hi, this is the so-and-so experiment on AMSAT Oscar 21 as the text inside a 1200 baud packet frame. And then on AO10, AO13, AO40, it was high as a 400 baud BPSK with Manchester encoding. So those sorts of things, you ramp up 
through the simpler modulations like that, um, all the way up to the the modulation and codings for DVB S2 and S2X, of which there are many combinations of modulations and uh, forward error correction code rates. So I think including all of that is a good idea, and it would make the signal um, useful outside of DVB S2 and S2X receiving stations. We could also include polar codes or experimental codes, and this we would just cycle through all of these whenever the, the there were there wasn't any user signals, user traffic. Since DVB S2 and S2X have the idea of, well, you know, uh, you know, it, it's always transmitting. There's never not any frames that are transmitted in a in the digital downlink. Then putting in uh, default digital downlink content is easy. It's an easy thing to to imagine. You know, so instead of sending the typical dummy frames, you send actual useful information, telemetry or test signals, so that people can use it. So, the but the question. Rose is like, well, uh, you know, what about you not know, just dummy frames, but also sending other signals like the IARU and, and Oscar approach? Won't the transmissions that are in some other waveform appear to be uh, loss of signal to a DVBS, DVBS 2X uh, receiver, and that'll cause it to go crazy for an arbitrary amount of time until it reachieves sync? All right, so let's see. When last we spoke, it said you, you thought it was a bad idea to mix up the modulations in terms of like the digital stuff and then classical sort of legacy stuff that we should uh, stay focused on the mission and not, uh, not I, do that. I think it might be worth thinking twice about anyway. The, yeah. The okay. simplicity of having the downlink always be the same thing is really an, a nice simplicity to have. It means that the receive stations can be simpler and more predictable in behavior. Plus, okay. it'll guarantee compatibility with off-the-shelf commercial receivers, which already know how to do DBBS 2X continuously. Yeah, that's a good point. How about anything more complicated? Like, could we... So I guess the, the, that argument extends to the polar codes and the other other forward error correction style uh, things that that uh, the commercial gear, like an off-the-shelf chip, wouldn't know what to do if it wasn't LDBC BCH error correction. Like it, it it would not compute. So you would have most of the uh, most of the flow would work up to the point where it would decode. And then you get a decoding error. I don't know what exactly it would look like. Uh, you know, it, it kind of depends, I guess, on the chip or the implementation. Um, but it sounds like the, the the argument might apply to to doing some of the more advanced codes outside of uh, past LDPC. I think it would. Anything it gets outside the standard. Any, any standards compliant receiver is justified in throwing up its hands and saying, "I don't know what to do with this. It's loss of signal." Okay. I mean, yeah, one, these if are... you wanted to do something traditional in the amateur satellite community, you could designate like a day of the week for an experimental node. An experimenter's Wednesday and go to polar code one Wednesday and non-polar code on the next Wednesday or whatever you got. Um, but I think that disrupts the notion of a continuous service. And uh, that, this makes it more of an experimenter's toy than a communication platform, which I'm not sure I'm in favor of. Yeah. I think the intentions are very, very good. You know, trying to provide useful beacons. Um, but there may be other ways to achieve that within an open source, um, you know, uh, within an open source organization like us. There's there's other ways to support it rather than than trying to make the transponder do all all things to all communities, to all receivers. To to a lot of people, it would be seen as a as additional use of the bands and and uh, you know something that was familiar and that they could dust off equipment and, and get on the air, receiving it very quickly. 
but there is there it is problematic for the reasons that you've said okay that's uh that's a lot of a lot of things to think about in terms of writing a like a, a specification though i i think that it's a straightforward um thing to to go through to cycle through all the code rates and and modulations within dvbs2 and s2x and have known you know, here's a uh, a talk or a, some sort of content you know that it's not just random data uh, that we're transmitting that it is some known signal that you would recognize uh you know we have friends that use adventure time as examples for for things that are transmitted over the air and which is it's pretty brilliant because it's it's so recognizable so i think that we should do the same that the actual data the test pattern should be something recognizable and relatively short and then you know if, as long as you see it if, you, if there's any outages um, then those code rates and that particular modulation are, are something that, that your station is having trouble with and can it shows you where the edges are of your your ability to to demod and decode on the other hand uh, a pattern that is just like a simple uh, pseudo random sequence that would be easy to check for bit exactness has its advantages too like a bit error rate test pattern you might have room for both okay so I think the next step is writing that down and putting it, publishing it out as a proposal, and and seeing, you know, what what's uh, what we can achieve there. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? No, I think as long as you stay inside the bounds of dbvs 2 x that you don't need to don't need to get too excited about it uh, until further down the road. Systems already designed for dbs 2 x and becomes more of an operational concern. What do you put in the in the okay. channel when you don't have anything else to do? Yeah. The next item on our agenda is the 10 slash 24 gigahertz dual band feed lab test plan results and next steps. And we, we don't have as many results today as I would really like because tonight's the uh, San Bernardino Microwave Society meeting. And I wanted to spread the word about any lab test results over the past month or so. Uh, so we don't have as many as I would like, but uh, thanks to your collection uh, efforts, we have some good photographs and some some papers, which I'm going to share with SBMS and ask if anybody would like some of the feeds that we uh, have in order to start putting together a station and getting some test results on on 24 gigahertz especially so we have one feed that's out to a volunteer and they'll, they'll they have a, a really good uh, test lab at work that they are willing to to share with us for for getting the results uh, it just hasn't happened yet and and it will eventually uh, and then we have another volunteer that's going to look at 10 gigahertz specifically so we're, I'm looking for people to to really test and explore the 24 gigahertz response. So gain and frequency and pattern. And then all of those results will go into link budgets for, for this particular set of frequencies, which is of great interest uh, from several groups and universities. Then looking at the dual band feed, it's like, okay, what, what RF boards are needed in order to provide uh, 10 gigahertz uplink and a 24 gigahertz downlink for the transponder. So that's proceeding, and I'm, I'm very happy about it. The the feeds from Paul, are from Paul Wade. It's his design, and they're they're quite lovely. Now let's see. Did Here's I... an additional thought on testing that 10 gigahertz, uh, 24 gigahertz dual band feed. Um, I think all the testing so far has been pretty theoretical and uh, the stuff in Paul Wade's paper uh, shows that he measured the loss from 24 through 24 gigahertz with a filter and everything but what I haven't seen any practical result is actually running it full duplex uh, if we can get somebody who's got all the equipment for both bands uh, including a power amplifier um, at whatever at the 
whichever band is the uplink band, um, to actually run some power through the transmit side and, and then try to measure descents on the receive side um, in a practical application with a real antenna pointed at real sky or maybe pointed at a test antenna down the range or something like that. Um, might We might learn something from that. Yeah, that would be the, I think that would be great. I would like like to see that very much. Okay, I think that that's, that's something that I'll, um, I'll prepare that as sort of a pitch to uh, SBMS tonight and also put it out for San Diego Microwave Group to see if someone would be willing to, to do exactly that. It's a good idea. And if people are, uh, are interested in doing this kind of test and don't have access to 24 gigahertz, um, it would also be useful to do this kind of test on our five and, and dime dual band feed of which we have you know, one machine and one printed yeah which haven't been tested very thoroughly yeah okay i will amend the the pitch to include both i think we have we have pretty good lab results uh that we have on the poster so we have a poster about this that sort of presents the sort of a high level here here you go here's the achievement of the five and 10 gigahertz dual band feed, but you're right. I don't think it's been used in anger with a with a PA, and we have not confirmed. And in, in my opinion, we haven't confirmed the isolation. We can see that it matches the theoretical, and that that it's good enough for for what we set out to do. It should achieve the goals, but if we follow the philosophy of it not working until it's tested, then it doesn't work yet. So sure. that'd be good to do. And both of them as large metal objects, they're they're pretty solid metal machined uh, dual band feeds. Paul Wade's advice on productizing them was that most of it can be replaced with plastic, like um, you know the feeds, the commercial feeds that you have for for satellite television, that only a little bit of it needs to be metal. And we do have some experience with metalizing 3D printed, parts. So the process of turning these feeds into something that's much less expensive to make uh, or involved to make will be uh, very beneficial. And especially if you want to get on the air, you know, then then having an inexpensive dual band feed would would go a long way to making uh, personal stations much easier to to put together uh, to achieve. So it's it's work well worth doing. It's uh, I'm not sure how exactly to to do it. So the again, you know, this will be something that we'll talk about at SBMS and SDMG, and you know, I'll 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 start reaching out with this particular job um, and the support that we can offer to all the different microwave communities that I can find. We have some link budget updates. Jan King did a spreadsheet that is. Um, extensive, and I have s distributed the spreadsheet directly to people interested in working on link budgets. It's also in our repository. And I've asked a few people to think about taking this Excel spreadsheet, which is, uh, is multiple mini tabs and lots of macros and a tremendous number of amount of processing and computing in it. And we should look at converting it to a Jupyter notebook. And, you know, so not just using the Excel spreadsheet as is, which we will, um, but also taking the work and, and uh, you know, presenting it, converting it, or porting it um, to, to Python. And there's some big advantages here that you know, there's nothing wrong with the Excel. Um, it's the most widely used programming language in the world, according to many people. And this link budget is top notch and world class. There are limitations in Excel. The expressiveness of, of Excel is somewhat limited and the difficulty in debugging and testing the macros and, and the other equations in this spreadsheet is a, has been acknowledged as a, as a challenge for a long time 
by by the author and by everybody that's helped Jen King along the way with the spreadsheet. You know, being able to do unit tests is a big advantage, and the um, visualizations from Jupyter Notebook are are quite good. You can get lots of visualizations from Excel, and the spreadsheet has many that are quite good, but it's limited compared to, um, you know, compared to Jupyter Notebooks. So I've I've asked around, and there are a couple of people who are who, their interest has been piqued by this, and we may start work on that, um, you know. As a as a sort of a formal subproject of of ORI, so that would add to our collection of of link budgets. There, I view link budgets as sort of a wear item, and they are uh, a model. Some are very simple. Some some of the link budgets that we have are are a single page. Uh, they don't include any real implementation losses, or they just put in a number. Some of them are more. Uh, complex, you know, they're they're more complicated, and they handle a variety of situations or a variety of modulation and coding, a variety of you know, you can you can start to modify them, and then this one is a very complex link budget with lots and lots of stuff in it that you can manipulate and and move. Then you know we get sometimes we get different answers for different from different link budgets, and that tends to relate down to the assumptions, like the underlying assumptions. So so some of the assumptions for some of our link budgets are are that the implementation losses are very huge. Some assumptions relate to the um, the temperature, uh, you know, noise temperature. The assumptions of, of some link budgets are totally different than others. So this is a natural variation, you know, in in a, a multivariable set of documents. You know, the, all these documents are multivariable. Some are much more multivariable than others. And the inner relationships between all these variables create a huge search space for, for data and for information. So this is, to me, it's like, ah, you know, they're, they're not gonna agree. Um, they, some of them are focused on different, solving different problems. Uh, so adding another significant link budget to the, to the collection is a big step forward. And then converting it into a Jupyter notebook would be uh, a, a good service. So that's that's where we're at on that. All right, that's I think that's all of the items that I published, except for the additional items and questions. So what questions do you have? Oh, sorry. Uh, Hello there. I've, Hello. <laughs> yeah, I'm Salvatore, and I connected uh, very, very later. I, I'm a curious um, uh, an organization uh, think. Um, where, where this project is uh, um, is headed, for example, to watch FPGA code, uh, test benches, and uh, um, uh, it's a minor mistake. I I didn't uh, I, I'm, I haven't going deep uh, in documentation, but uh, can you please point me some some of these uh, uh, source uh, repository? Thanks. Okay. Yes, I, I sure can. You're you're asking where the current FPGA uh, code, uh, test bench code, and things like that is is located. I can. Yeah, and also the architecture uh, where FPGA is expected to to use. Uh, is there really something uh, people are trying uh, test bench uh, setup? Just a documentation to to starting approach to the to the to the project. Thanks. Oh sure, yes, I I can help with that. Hey Paul, is there any update or anything that you want to talk about with respect to Remote Lab? I can say a few words. Um, one of the most recent things we've gotten working in the Remote Lab is the ability to take a screenshot from the user's computer. Um, each of the pieces of test equipment we bought is remotely controllable, and most of those devices usually come with a way to get a copy of what's on the screen. Uh, for some reason, probably associated with trying to sell their own software, uh, most of the manufacturers do not document uh, exactly how to get a screenshot. They have big thick manuals that explain how to control all the functions of the instrument, 
that omitted from that document is how to get a screenshot. So I've been trying to create little sample programs in Python that, that get a screenshot based on a little bit of reverse engineering and a lot of Googling because uh, other people have already solved this problem. Um, so we got these little scripts and they work great locally if you run them on the, the Raspberry Pi that's the, serving as the gateway to the remote lab. But with our WireGuard uh, based virtual private network solution for remote, remote control of the instruments, which is one of the, the two methods for getting remote access, the other one being just SSH, it seems to not work that well. Uh, it should work just fine. It should be transparent, it might be a little slower. Um, but what we're seeing now is that sometimes the screenshot just fails. And I'm trying to debug exactly why that happens. I'm in the remote lab right now. Uh, let me switch my screen around if I can figure out how to do that in, sh in short order. Yeah. So here's the, the screen for the Raspberry Pi, which, if you can see it, is running Wireshark. And here's all the instruments in the remote lab. And this is my laptop, uh, which is also running Wireshark. If I get the Slack out of the way, running Wireshark there. Um, and I'm looking at the same transaction on both sides. So here I am. The neighbor's house coming in uh, through the virtual private network. And this is the same set of transactions on this screen as on this screen. And uh, you're not gonna be able to see it here in the Zoom call, but they're not exactly the same. And this suggests that there's some problems with the packets being dropped through the uh, through the VPN. And I got to find out why and fix it or else this whole scheme of remote access through the VPN is going to be useless. Uh, so that's where I'm at on that. Okay, what's the alternative is? This is actually Wally's baseline and maybe end up be a smarter way to do everything. It's, it's simply an SSH session where you have a connection to a command line on the uh, on the remote PC here in the remote lab. Uh, back up a little for people who aren't familiar with it. The remote lab will actually have two computers in it. The Raspberry Pi that, that I'm debugging with now is just a gateway and its purpose is to control access. Uh, and it's the only thing that has access to the public internet here in the remote lab. Uh, everything else is on a private LAN for security and so on, ease of uh, dealing with the world when the world is restricted to one bench top. Uh, in addition to that, there'll be a, a powerful Windows PC, which we'll have here soon, we hope, uh, which is able to run multiple virtual machines, uh, probably Python or excuse me, Linux virtual machines of some flavor or other. And most of our testing will be happening in those virtual machines. It's the baseline for access to those virtual machines and to the uh, overall powerful lab computer is through SSH, which is a, a connection oriented rather than a virtual private network thing. So you log into the virtual machine on the machine, which is behind the Raspberry Pi. That's all one SSH command. And now you've got immediate access and you're running on, essentially running on the Windows machine or on the virtual machine inside the Windows machine. From there, you have no handicaps, right? As long as you're on that machine, you're on the LAN, you've got high bandwidth connections and things you need high bandwidth connections to, uh, and everything should work better. The downside is that the interface to you uh, as a person on the other end of uh, the internet uh, may be a little slow and, and clunky. So you might have to stop and uh, pull a file over and look at it or, or whatever. But all the file collection and real-time processing will be happening local here without having to squeeze through the internet. Uh, that'll be better in a lot of ways, but does require you to work sort of at arm's length to the computer you're working on. You never get a chance to do anything that you can't do through a terminal or through a, uh, an X windowing session if you, if you set up your SSH session that way. So we're trying to converge on a set of tools that work and, and get all these 
ridiculous little startup things out of the way and well documented. So people coming in to actually use the remote lab won't have to invent them from scratch. Yeah, thank you. It's well worth the time and effort. And I think speaking for myself, I've learned an awful lot uh, about networking that I didn't know before <laughs> in, uh, in, in dealing with this and in trying to get the, the lab set up. Oh, it's really wonderful to see all these instruments uh, well orchestrated. Uh, I mean, I often uh, work at the, uh, on train uh, with mobile connection, and I find uh, MOSH uh, to be useful. Uh, it is uh, a thing that uh, uh, can reestablish connection in case of troubles. I, I hope you have a fiber connection, uh, symmetrical, uh, uh, with, a, with a good operator. I don't know if uh, it's the case. Uh, once one have a redirect the session uh, through SSH, one can, for example, start the local browser, and uh, some instruments can use uh, an HTTP server to connect on. So, uh, ideally, this I don't know if this can uh, help, or um, or is something uh, you already uh, evaluated. You have yeah, access. I, I've learned about Mosh recently, and. and that would be a good thing to have set up here on the on the PC in the lab. Uh, it has pros and cons, I, uh, but it's valuable in a lot of ways. The uh, unfortunately, I, I can't claim to have the high speed symmetrical fiber connection. This is on a typical US style uh, home internet connection, so it's asymmetric uh, and not as fast as it ought to be for fiber. There's not uh, an alternative to to go all the way to fiber and symmetric in this neighborhood. Uh, there is a carrier that has higher speeds and less asymmetry that I may switch to or add on possibly. That hasn't been done yet. Okay, but instrument, how are chested? I know I have to read document, to, to be, but uh, um, is it possible to uh, to have a HTTP access or uh, I don't know uh, which other means to control uh, eventually remote system. The instruments, all I think they all have the both USB and Ethernet connections. The Ethernet connections are not uh, web-based. They're not HTTP. They're uh, using the uh, instrumentation protocol called the uh, VSA. Okay. And so any program that talks to these instruments has got to be able to speak that protocol. Some of the, uh, the instruments come with programs that you can run on Windows uh, that will provide oh, you a okay. graphical interface. Okay. Uh, some of them, that's kind of special and not everything you'd want it to be. If you're doing something that's reasonably cut and dried that you've already figured out and automated, you're probably going to talk directly to the visa interface and, and do basic operations like go and collect the data. And then yeah. processing will be in your scripts. Um, for fiddling around with it, then one of those GUI programs might be useful. And whatever we can get our hands on, we'll use, of course. <laughs> I'm sure it's documented somewhere. And I'm curious to I can add perhaps uh, better on, um, I'm an embedded engineer. Uh, I normally uh, work in labs. So when I saw uh, your environment, I I, feel, I had a good feeling <laughs> um, just to be at work. Um, and I, I can help, uh, especially from the firmware side. I, I read um, you are also uh, uh, architecting the, uh, the, the firmware part, but I'm curious. Uh, to have a look also at the FPGA part. I work at the telecommunication area. So I and Q is something uh, I used in OBSI. It's a, an old, uh, not so spread um, interface through radio head and uh, baseband. Uh, and so um, I'm curious to uh, read how this concept are uh, applied now. Uh, and uh, especially how this communication technology can 
uh, increase uh, freedom in, uh, in, in <laughs> because now we have a, a, a very need we are very eager uh, of freedom so um, uh, having a sat communication uh, I expect this will uh, uh, is something that will, inc will be increasing in next years uh, and so this is why I'm joining the and trying to uh, to help with my limited uh, capacity uh, to the project. Yes. Well, thank you. That's exactly why we're we're doing it to try to liberate these uh, advanced and really wonderful protocols and put them in as open source cores for for you to to take and to use in, in FPGA and also to to design implement build systems that are that are open source. Uh, so thank you. Your your time and your attention and your questions are deeply appreciated, uh, and we'll we'll do our best to make sure that everything that we're doing is very well documented and and clear. But thank you. <laughs> it's something that uh, documentation is never. Uh, it's a very extra work. But by doing a good documentation requires work. I, I didn't expect to. Uh, I expect to uh, go in deep also in the in the code in the in the schema, electric schema, not the, the, uh, because time obviously is needed to uh, to uh, make algorithms, uh, validate, uh, use uh, do MATLAB simulation and things like that. So, so I understand it's uh, a huge project. I admire you, uh, you guys, for your uh, activity. Well, thank you. We'll we'll keep it up. Yeah, the 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 job of uh, documenting is never done and never perfect, but we will do our best to to get it as close as we can. As far as I can write, this is <laughs> at least I can write. <laughs> I can help at least for the documentation it would be a great success for me. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. Well, I don't I don't have any more items and any more questions before we close for today. Not for me, thank you. All right. Yeah. Well, okay. Thanks, and uh, see you. See you again. If not uh, for next week, uh, then I'll try to have this again on uh, next Thursday. It's so far, it's worked out to be a pretty good day for it. So, thanks everybody for coming to office hours, and see you again very soon. Thanks, you, Michelle. Yeah. Thanks for the hour. It's a perfect hour for me. This. This one. Other meetings with the US are very <laughs> happen at late time, so this is perfect. Yeah. For, if uh, you kept uh, this uh, uh, this hour for me is uh, is very good. Thanks. All right, I will do. See you again soon. Bye, 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 Michelle. Bye. -bye.